um, using some necessary and sufficient criteria. And what I found there in, in this is you've had some really quite bizarre things coming up. For example, I pulled one out here just for fun. And uh, it's this idea uh, of a category called psychogenic pain and distress. And I thought, what, you know, what, what does that? And I, I've only just looked this up today just, ju just to see what was in there. I, I didn't even remember this was in here. And I mean, I guess the idea is, is, that, is that dogs have pain that they imagine somehow in this. And of course, this is something that's probably been borrowed from, from human psychology. So um, the stuff in the book is great. Uh, and I must say that, that Karen overall abandoned that way, that very regimented way of trying, doing, uh, trying to do things fairly quickly because it simply didn't fit. Um, and I looked around and looked around, but you know, I'd, I'd, I kind of got the bug, if you like, and looked around and um, came across Cope. And what attracted me to them was obviously the, the, you know, the charismatic characters in there, people like Professor Peter Neville, who, who I've become very dear friends with, um, Robin Walker, he was very eccentric, but you know, an absolute genius when it came to uh, neurophysiology and pharmacology and that kind of thing. And what kind of uh, lit or floated my boat there is that they were unashamedly anthropomorphic. So um, the emotion of the animal, the feelings of the animal came first. And that was really important because it was obviously how I felt and it was obviously how most dog owners feel. It certainly wasn't how the rest of the science community felt. Thinking or talking about emotions in pets was 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 really um, something you didn't do. Um, but they were unashamedly and anthropomorphic. So I went and did the courses there. Uh, I was then very privileged because I was asked to do some teaching and that kind of stuff as well. And then was offered a partnership. Um, but what I liked about them is that not only did they have this this you know highly anthropomorphic. Um, stance but also they had a system which was the emra system you know that, that that was there before i came in i had nothing to do with with, with developing that or evolving that it was already there um, and it fitted well because it, it it went through the things of talking about the emotional state of the animal and then looking at the mood state and then what's reinforcing that behavior so there was a system that i had been used to in veterinary medicine um, and then in 2005, you know, the, the only thing we didn't have at that time was any kind of scientific proof that emotions actually did exist in animals. It was all purely speculation. Uh, and this, you know, this came from what Robin had found in the literature and what Peter had found. Um, but it was still very speculative and very against the grain of, 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 what, of what was understood and what was believed in mainstream science. And 2005, there was a bunch of papers. You know, one of my pleasures in life was, was grabbing a bunch of scientific papers and taking them up onto the downs um, and reading them on nice sunny days with my, with my Spaniel Maggie at the time. And there happened to be a bunch of papers I took up that summer of 2005. And it included a whole edition of uh, a journal called Cognitive, Consciousness and Cognition, which had a whole special edition on the neurobiology of animal consciousness. And I had you know, so these people I'd never heard of before. There was somebody called Pangs Epimer and Bernard Bars and Beyond Merker and Anil Seth. Um, and I started reading through these and I got the Pangseps thing. And my kind of jaw dropped because it was the kind of thing we've been looking at for all this time. So I kind of rushed home and got hold of Peter and um, he pulled through all this literature as well. We got Pangseps book um, and read that. And we spent the next 12 months or so, probably nearly 18 months, plowing through all this stuff. And by autumn 2006, kind of a year later, uh, we'd incorporated the Pangsep systems into our diploma. And also Peter and I had, had, had rushed out um, a whole lot of uh, um, articles into the veterinary press. We'd been doing this since 2004 anyway, just pushing the idea about the, uh, that emotions matter and this kind of stuff. But then we came to 2005, 2006, uh, October, um, my argument is that that was the first time that the Pangsep systems ever got into the literature, the broader literature of companion animal behavior. They'd been hidden away in the, in the kind of academic circles, but they'd never reached um, uh, you know, as far as uh, and wide. And I think that's kind of what started the ball rolling. And so that was all very well and good. Um, and I, I think, what I'd like to do, it, so therefore there's no learning involved. So there's no learning involved in, in, in the dog, a dog smelling some food and salivating. Um, it's there as an innate reflex. 
And what Pavlov's argument was is that this is simply a reflex. There's no, there's no thought or emotion involved. It's purely a stimulus response reaction. And the same with withdrawal reflexes in, in dogs. Um, you know, when, when Pankset would, when um, Pavlov would, would, was, was describing this, he described it purely as a withdrawal reflex. And it was completely mindless because he didn't, he didn't really think about uh, dogs having emotions or feelings or feeling pain or fear or anything like that. And what Pankset was saying is, uh, you know, look here, these circuits are there, but what I'm demonstrating is an actual fact they're also connected up to a little intrinsic effective circuit or, or an emotion circuit in the midbrain as well. Um, and so, you know, we talk about these, these inbuilt circuits and hey, I've not only found one for fear, which is basically what the withdrawal reflex is, and for salivation, which is effectively what the seeking system is, um, I've also found these other ones, which are to do with care and, and attachment and rage and, and lust and those sort of things as well. And all of these things have these, have these emotional components to them as well. So they're all reflexive. They're all um, inbuilt. They're all innate. They go back a long way phylogenetically. Uh, so you'll find them in many, many animals and they're attached to feelings. Um, and that's kind of where he stopped with them. He, he, called, he called them emotional systems. And what he, what he was very clear about is that they weren't to be mixed up and confused with um, the, the, the other kinds of emotions that other people were talking about, like Paul Aik Aikman with his emotions on facial expressions and that kind of thing. And much more lately, more recently, uh, people like Feldman Barrett with her, with her constructed emotions and all this sort of thing, and Edmund Rolls, Jeff Gray, Joseph Ledoux, they also talked about emotions, but Pankset wasn't talking about the same thing at all. He was talking about these midbrain structures. And what he was in effect describing is what we now call uh, discrete emotions, because they're there, they have a place, um, you, you know where they are inside the, you know, inside the brain, uh, Pankset systems in the midbrain, um, and they're, 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 they're sort of there and they're kind of set. A lot of a lot of people in in neuroscience didn't did you know don't believe they still don't accept that discrete emotions exist. What they prefer is what is called a dimensional model, which is more an ethereal thing where there's no actual place where emotions are in the brain. They just kind of constructed a made as you go along and and they float around in this in this space this imaginary space, um, and they simply offer color to what we're doing and what we're thinking. And, that, and that's what emotions are, but there's no particular place for them. Um, so I think one of the big mix-ups in how we talk about emotionality in animals is this division we seem to have of, of, of found ourselves in between Pankset's discrete emotions and somebody like Feldman Barrett's dimensional emotions, where she talks about these, re re these, these constructed emotions. Now, what I argue, and I've made a little, a little prop here, is that what Pankset's talking about are, uh, can, you know, you can use as a fairly good analogy, uh, the, the inkjet, uh, the inkjet you know, cartridges I put into my printer, where all I have to do is put four colors in, black, yellow, blue, and, and red, and out of that, I get something like that, which is, you know, a beautiful color image with all the colors of the rainbow. It's got all the richness and everything that we experience seeing, seeing that image. And I argue that basically both these kinds of emotional systems exist. So we have Pankset's seven core emotional <coughs> systems as they are. Um, we're justified in calling them emotional systems, but they are completely separate, but they are connected to these other kind of emotional systems, which are the dimensional ones that give us all the color and richness. So I don't see a, a kind of battle between people like Pangsep uh, and people like Feldman Barrett, who seem to argue among themselves about which ones are correct. As far as I see it, they're actually both correct. And I think it's worth taking a little journey um, through how these emotional systems work in the brain. And I'll use some analogies here just so we can see how they connect together. So if you can imagine you've got a field of dogs, uh, they're all running around playing. Some of the dogs know each other, some of them don't. 
Um, over there in the corner, we've got a dog that really is quite frightened of other dogs, doesn't like being on the outside and they're clingy. You can see the ears are back and the tail's down. So they're kind of anxious and we could say that they're, they're kind of occupying Panksept fear system in a way. Um, we've got another couple of dogs that are playing, they're friendly, they're doing their play bows and messing around like dogs do. And what we could say is, yes, there we go, there we, we can see Panksept's um, emotional systems being expressed there through play. We've then got another dog over there in the corner, which is on heat. And there's a whole lot of other male dogs all surrounding this little dog and the owner frantically trying to, trying to fend them off and protect her little, her little darling. So we can see lust there as well. And then we've got another dog which is busy seeking and following the, 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 the urine trail of the dog that's on heat. And we say that you know, he's, he's got his nose down on the ground, sniff, 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 sniff. What we would say is this dog is basically in seeking system. Now, my question is, right, that's all well and good, but surely there must be more to it than that. What, what, where, where, where's the, that there's a gap somewhere in that argument to say, well, that dog's in seeking system, that dog's in play system, that dog's in lust system, that dog's in fear system. There's a gap somewhere between what we're saying the dog feels and between what the dog is actually doing. There's a whole, there's a whole plethora of stuff. So I think it's, it's useful just for a moment to think about what's happening to the neurotransmitters when this, let, let's just take the seeking dog as a, as a nice simple example. This dog's got his nose to the ground, he's sniffing away. Um, he's got the olfactory, the sensory signals of smell coming into his olfactory epithelium in his nose. Uh, this gets transported up into the olfactory system. Um, it works its way up into the olfactory tubercle, which is the olfactory's uh, system's analog or uh, place, which is equivalent to the nucleus accumbens, which is what we're all used to uh, in terms of the dopamine system and the seeking system. We talk about seeking system being both dopamine driven and the dopamine is going up into the nucleus accumbens and the, dogs feel, the dog feels reward. Um, for smell, it goes up to the olfactory tubercle. And my, uh, my argument here is right, we've got, we've got it in there. We've got this, this, this dopamine signal in the, in the reward system, the olfactory tubercle, the smell. What happens to it then? What happens to that then? Well, in the uh, human brain, there is something like about 500,000 dopamine neurons. And in the dog brain, there are about a tenth of that. So we can say it's you know, roughly about 25,000, 20,000, something like that. Some of those are, are involved in, in what we're talking about now, the seeking system. And what happens to those, um, as well as going to the nucleus accumbens, they also go to other places as well. Like, for example, up into the basal ganglia, which is the structure which sits somewhere between the midbrain and the limbic system and the frontal cortex up here. So it, it straddles all parts. Um, and this dopamine neuron goes up uh, into, into parts of the basal ganglia, which is the uh, ventral stratum or nucleus accumbens, sends branches up to the amygdala. So it's talking to that as well, um, the, the ventral medial nucleus of that. And it also sends branches up into the cerebral cortex, which is this, this, this shell-like part right up in our, in a, in a, on, on top of our skulls. Uh, the prefrontal cortex in particular, which of course is the thinking part of the brain. Now, um, if you look at the number of neurons in that part of the brain, I said there are something like about half a million um, dopamine neurons in a human, about 20,000 in a dog. Inside the cerebral cortex, there are of the order of 17 billion neurons. So, you know, the, the, it's orders and orders of magnitude bigger. And what happens to these dopamine neurons is they go up in some of those synapses to these cortical neurons. Now, the traditional way that you have taught physiology when you did your physiology courses, if you're a behaviorist or trainer, whatever, is that you've got this thing called a neuron and the neuron's got an input and an output. And we have a signal coming into the dendritic end of a neuron, passes down the neuron as this action potential. And it then passes out of that neuron at its terminal end into another neuron. So that the, the unit of action in the brain is this neuron. Now in the brain, certainly the cortex, things get rather more complicated because each of those 17 billion, 17 billion neurons in the cortex don't have just one other neuron connecting to them. 
they have of the order of 7,000 to 10,000 other neurons connecting to them. So every single one of those, 10, those 17 billion neurons in you and me, or um, a couple of billion in, in a dog, have something like 7,000 to 10,000 other neurons connecting to them. Now, those other neurons are other neurons from the cortex. They're inhibitory neurons like GABA neurons. Some of those neurons are going to be our dopamine neurons that have come up from this, the olfactory tubercle of this dog that's following the scent of the bitch. And the way that, that the particular, this particular neuron that I'm talking about in, in the cerebral cortex fires is through a very democratic process of having enough of those seven to 10,000 neurons attached to it, also firing at exactly the right time in synchrony to create a big enough action potential to fire our single neuron in the, in, the, in the cerebral cortex. And not only that, it's more complicated because about 10% of all those seven to 10,000 neurons attaching to our single neuron in the cerebral cortex are inhibitory. So about 90% are excitatory. They'll, they'll get this neuron to fire about 10% um, of them are inhibitory. So you've got this incredibly complex interplay between all these neurons. And I've just talked about this one signal coming up from this one dopamine neurons, neuron. We haven't talked about serotonin in the midbrain, which is another system, about noradrenaline, about acetylcholine. These are other things that are also stimulated by all of Pancept systems in one way or another. Um, now it's interesting because Pancep never said very much at all about serotonin, apart from the fact that it seems to dampen all the other emotions, which is correct. But it's because at the time he was doing his studies on this, serotonin was a very inaccessible neurotransmitter to, to, to do anything with. It's incredibly difficult to measure because it's so buried away and it's so distributed. Noradrenaline is the same, by the way. Very, very difficult to study. So some of the earlier studies uh, on, on, on neurotransmitters are actually quite inaccurate and incomplete because they simply didn't have the tools to do it. And it's only since about 2010 where we've had much, much more sophisticated tools that some of what these things do has been unraveled. And it certainly appears that, that, that uh, you know, these other things like serotonin and noradrenaline and acetylcholine, et cetera, also play major roles in the emotional lives of animals. So following on with our, with our trace of this dopamine neuron, this has gone up, it's attached itself to this, this one neuron we're talking about in the cerebral cortex. That one neuron also has this other, you know, seven to 10,000 other neurons attached to it, and it is one of 7 billion. What those 7 billion neurons are doing now is deciding what to do with that bit of information. The dopamine system is a, is, a, is a salient system. I prefer to, you know, to call it a salient system rather than a reward system. Reward is just a payoff. The salience is about telling the dog that something important is happening. And for this dog following the scent trail around in, in, in the park, it's not just about pleasure. What the brain's doing is trying, is trying to pick out the bits of that sensory information from the dog's nose to say, is this, is this important? And from the point of view of survival, of course it is, because you've got, a, you've got a female dog over there who's on heat. We have a male dog here whose job it is to go and spread his genes. That's what, that's what he's been evolved to do. And that's what Pancept's lust system is designed to do. So seeking is, 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 is also playing into this dog's lust system. But far from this fairly simplistic picture here that all we've got involved is the seeking system and the seeking system is, is is what is generating this dog's behavior of doing the seeking. We've got all this other stuff among the 7 billion odd other neurons in the brain with all these interconnections, which then have to connect through to the basal ganglia and the, and the, 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 the uh, primary motor cortex, which then guides the behavior of that dog following the scent. So in all of this, there's a hell of a lot more than just a pancept system driving this behavior. And so the way I see these systems play out is that we've got these two systems. We've got, we've got Pancept's core emotional systems, which are a nice, neat, and easy add-on to what we've known before. We've got the other work of people like Joseph Ledoux and all the work he did over you know, the 1970s, 1980s. Uh, Feldman Barrett more recently with her constructed emotion theory, which I know a lot of people don't like at all. Um, 
but bearing in mind the book she wrote was very much opinion based. It was her opinion and her interpretation of what she has found. It's not really supported by her by the science that, that she uses to back it up because that's all based primarily on imaging. And imaging doesn't tell you anything about how an animal or how a, how a human, which is you know, the, 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 the subjects of her work, um, actually feel. All it does is, is, is you can self-report and it measures signals inside their brains, inside their cortices. And this, this is what she was looking at. So although she's discounted the existence of Pangsep's uh, discrete emotions, she's not the only one, and lots of other people do as well. And so that's not uncommon, but um, you know, the, the facts are the facts. We know these systems are there. We know they do play an integral role in feeding the, the, this, the, these signals up uh, coming in from the outside world through the midbrain um, into, the, into the limbic system, through the basal ganglia, through into these 10 billion cortical neurons, 17 billion cortical neurons, and then out again through the primary motor cortex and, and, the, and the dorsal striatum or basal ganglia for the behavior. There's a hell of a lot going on. So what I see in that whole sequence of all, of all the things those dogs are doing in that field is starting with this. So we've got our, our seven emotional systems. You can pretend these cartridges are, are the four positive ones, seeking, play, care, and lust. And of course, if you just imagine that I've, I've added another, another three colors here um, to make the seven, which are the three negative ones, um, and all of those add together up in all those pre-cortical services, um, to get what we get in what we see of, of, of the output. And that, that, that's, that's the output behavior. So it's a combination of all those things. So it's a combination of what Lisa Feldman Barrett's um, calls her constructed emotions, Joseph Ledoux, um, Edmund, Barrett, uh, uh, Edmund Rolls, Jeff Gray. Um, all of those are, are, are people who support the idea of dimensional emotions. So that's, that's how I see um, the Pangstep emotional systems actually working in the overall scheme of things. I love the, um, uh, I've got this so much there, I'm not going to go and do all that. You can explain it really well because this is, <clears throat> like I say, this is complicated uh, stuff. And, um, and I think I love the analogy of using the ink and how the final result, that picture, will also be different every time. Yes. Uh, yes. And I think this is part of the, complexity of this because I talk a lot about the emotional experience and the kind of subjectivity of that, of, of that and how, in, how, how individual it is because yes. it is the perspective, it is the um, perception of things for the individual that ultimately mm. helps to frame these things. Mm. And I think what you're saying there is that Panskep, for example, that work was revolutionary and important but it's recognizing that it's a component part of other things. And I know even when I was doing my own studies uh, in, in human psychology, there were, although that even then it was shifting slightly, yes. but there were so many different disparate camps, so many different people starting to focus in on a specific bias of an aspect. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of these discussions actually for us all really, especially just for us kind of more humble dog trainers who are looking at it now from trying to think about that emotional truth of the dog is recognizing that it isn't just one co core component part. This is no. about, it's not a binary thing. And so what does this mean then for the individual then do you think? Uh, Robert, especially when we think about things like mood state, when we think about that final filtering for the individual yeah. about what we do and what we perceive about what we do, okay. because that ultimately is what we're trying to work out. I think this is why science finds it difficult, of course, even some of the more recent things about uh, it's hard, isn't it, to kind of, you can measure so many different things regarding internal functions but to look what that end result might be like and start to predict it, yeah. it becomes very difficult yeah. because well, there's let, so many filters to go through. Uh, right, let, let, let's wind back. And in, in, in defense of the researchers and the research, the thing is that most of these studying, most of these things, well, nearly all of it, if you're a neuroscientist, you, your entire career is spent studying one little part of the brain. If you're a neuroscientist and your interest is what, you know, how serotonin works, and you want to know what serotonin is doing in the basal ganglia or in the midbrain or how it's connecting up to neurons in, in, in the prefrontal cortex, that's your career. That's it. You'll, 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 you'll spend your life doing that for the next 40 years and you, do, you won't know anything else. So 
the, the problem is there's no one neuroscience. There's all these little groups all over the place that have done their thing. And Panksepp is one of those. Panksepp spent his entire life actually studying the hypothalamus. That, that was his interest. His interest was how, you know, what, what actually control things like feeding behavior and appetite. And he was poking around in these tiny little areas in the hippocampus. And it's by doing that that he discovered extending a little bit forward, getting his needles in the wrong place, if you like, in the midbrain, that he started finding out that there are other things going on there. He was incredibly good at it. He was, he was, he's probably one of the world's best electrophysiologists because he was so meticulous. You can imagine, you know, obviously the things he, he that a lot of these researchers do require quite invasive techniques, but, you know, skill that, that aside, the kind of skill involved in, in placing these tiny electrodes in tiny, tiny, tiny little brains in exact positions, which are, you know, a fraction of the size of a pinhead is absolutely amazing. You've got to be really good at it and you spend a lot of time practicing it. So a lot of these neuroscientists spend months and months, sometimes years, just learning the craft of how to do this. And so it's no surprise that we end up with all these different groups who have all these different ideas, because obviously you've, that's your life, that's your career. And of course, you're going to support that. And you don't, you don't talk about other things because actually you don't know what's going on. You haven't got time to read the literature about all the other things that are going on in science. And you know, to, to support people like Lisa Feldman Barrett, she's in the same boat. She spent her time um, using fMRI scanners and, and PET scanners and MEG scanners and that kind of thing doing her work. So again, she was in her own little kind of bottleneck, her own little room doing herself. Um, and I think the joy for us is that we can, we can take the long view. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a jack of all trades, master of none. And I'm, I'm proud of that. I, don't, I, 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 I nearly went down research. I, you know, I, was, I was offered a couple of PhDs decades ago and turned them down because, um, purely because the, the, the economic situation wasn't right for them. This is in the 1980s. And uh, everyone was so pessimistic then, there was no funding for them. And so I, you know, I, could, I could do the work, but the trouble is it was gonna run out of cash before I'd finished. And I, I didn't have any money, I had to go and earn money. I had no, I had no parents who could, who could support me for that. So I abandoned those. And to be honest, I'm actually glad I did because I would have been bottlenecked into something. I would have become one of these highly specialized trained people with a very one track um, vision. And so, you know, I, 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 I like to be the jack of all trades that stands back and just can, can dip into whatever I want to dip in and drop, drop things if I, you know, I lose interest in them. Um, but going on to your second point about mood state, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that, that's another one of these, these areas which I think is very much misunderstood. And mood state has, was always very much a part of what we did with, with, with COPE. And it was, um, it, it was always the thing we looked at as a kind of secondary thing to the emotional state. And it was another one of those moments when I was in the departure lounge of Luton Airport coming back from a gig. Strange how you always remember where you were, isn't it? When you, when, when you discover these things. And again, I had this pile of paper that I was looking at, these, these things I was looking through, um, waiting for my plane. And um, it was a paper by Mike Mendel that was uh, actually written in 2010. And I, I must have missed it somehow because it was now 2015. Um, and I read this and it was a paper he had written about trying to find more objective ways for assessing animal welfare. And he wasn't thinking about cats and dogs and that kind of thing. He was, he was thinking more about farm animals um, because uh, you know, you, you've, you've got, you've got uh, the, the standard way of measuring farm animal welfare had always been whether they're producing product or not. If you've got pigs and they're fattening and they're eating, they're eating fine and that kind of stuff, or you've got chickens that are laying eggs and you've got cows that are producing milk, they would only do that if their welfare was okay. And this was always the attitude of, of, of certainly farmers and also of, of mainstream science as well, simply because they didn't have the tools to measure something as subjective as, as feeling happy or having you know, a, a good, a good well being, a good quality of life. Uh, and the idea of, of talking about them having emotions, of course, is completely a no no. A cow with emotions? For goodness sake, what on earth are you talking about? Um, and Mendel came up with this idea that 
maybe we should be employing tools that are used from psychology, old tools, which was this idea of cognitive biases, which I'm sure everyone's familiar with now. You know, we all know that we're, uh, you know, we're biased towards the things that we believe already, and we tend to be biased against the things that we, that we don't believe in. This is confirmation bias. But there are many other kinds of biases as well. And one very important bias is the biases that we have um, through learned experiences of things that are positive and negative. And this is where Mendel was going with this. Um, he, he, what, what he said is that we know that um, if you have repeated or your life story is one of not necessarily terrible neg negative experiences, but even just little bits of negativity, negativity, no negativity, drip, drip, drip over a long period of time, your attitude towards other things coming into your life is probably going to be negative. You're going to be suspicious of it. And it dawned on me that what he was actually talking about here was mood state. And this is what he was, he, he was getting to with the way he was describing um, in the diagrams dimensional emotions. He was talking about these things which, which, which start to shift around in space from positive space to negative space and they tend to stabilize there. And uh, in, so I, I took this back and started looking at it and wrote a kind of draft paper about it in, in 2015. And Peter and I had many, many really interesting discussions on this uh, as we do, sort of late nights and, and whiskeys and those sort of things about really maybe we should start talking, instead of talking about EMRA, emotionality mood state, we ought to be talking about mood state emotionality because if mood states are dictating how an animal processes emotional states and how it processes the world around it, maybe mood states could, could, could ought to be coming first. And we couldn't do much with it, unfortunately, because by that time, we, our, our, our qualifications were Ofqual regulated. And Ofqual had very strict rules about whether you change things, learning outcomes and that kind of stuff um, in, in what you're teaching. So we couldn't go in and start teaching this simply because if we had, we would have really confused students and they would have written about mood states coming first and they probably then would have failed their exams. So we were in this kind of, this, this dilemma. But the good news is that I know my good friend and colleague, Karen Paneer of COPE International, which superseded COPE, she really took over our organization, is currently, as we speak, writing a book. I think she's just about finished, which describes in much more detail um, with many nuances um, the importance of, of mood state in relation to emotionality in animals. And mm -hmm. um, she had some help, I think, from our dear colleague, Carolina Westwood, who you know, I think, um, yes. spoke with her and, and had a chit chat with her. She's she coming into Dog Center Care in a couple of weeks. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And she, she, you know, she's the one that, that, that wrote that, that, that quite frank report uh, on, on Feldman Barrett's work. But, but, she, but she was involved in the input in, into this this uh, mood state, emotional state system, this mirror system it's now called. So I think that's a book well looking out, you know, well worth looking out for that's gonna be coming out at some point. I'm not quite sure when, um, but I'm sure Karen will let us know when it's available, but that'll be a really interesting take on this. I've not read it, I've not seen it, or any drafts of it, but I'm sure it'll be really good. But um, <clears throat> the, 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 the idea around mood state is that uh, the way I describe it is that what we do is we, if, if we look at a chart of um, arousal level and valence, which is feeling good, uh, you know, between feeling good and feeling bad, and arousal level feeling, you know, either positively absolutely fantastic, or or negatively incredibly fearful, or something like that. Um, so valence, uh, arousal level. What we can do, setting aside Pancep systems is as a dog goes through his daily life, as a human goes through his daily lives, we could on this chart plot where we think they are emotionally. Oh, I, I feel quite excited. I feel quite tired and sleepy. I feel a bit anxious because I've got the horrible letter through the post. We, we can chart what our emotional state is over time, just taking random samples um, over the course of a day. And I've actually been working with a company over the last couple of years developing a mood state tool 
and paring it down to its bare essentials, where we're using this kind of idea where owners will simply look at their dog and they can make a spot assessment of where their dog sits on this chart. So you could almost do it like one of these, one of these scales that they use in psychological tests of how are you feeling today? Where's your mood on a scale of one to 10? How do you feel? And you score it. It's, it's inaccurate, but it's accurate enough over time if you collect enough of these things um, to start painting a picture. And what we found is if we use a chart, a little chart to do this, and we're just plotting where owners see their dog's emotional state at any particular time of day, you know, maybe they've been left at home a little bit during the day, they visited the vet, so they're not feeling, you know, they're feeling a bit unhappy, so they're down here on the chart. They've been for a nice walk and met the friends, so they're up here, they're happy, their, their arousal level is, has been up and now it's down, they're relaxed, sitting on the sofa with the owner. And over time, what you start to get is a pattern. And where mood state comes in, if you draw a line around that pattern that you've got on the chart, you'll find that what you've got is a bias to one of the four quadrants of that chart. So you've either got sort of happy, excited, you've got unhappy, excited. So that, that's a kind of fear and all that kind of stuff. You've got kind of relaxed, happy, and relaxed, not happy. So relaxed, not happy, or calm, not happy, non-aroused, not happy would be, you're kind of depressed. Mm. down that quadrant you're spending a lot of time in your basket and suddenly you start to get the pattern emerge from an accumulation of emotional states over time mm. so that tends to be the way i describe mood states to owners and i think that's pretty accurate because it fits what we see from from psychiatry in the descriptions of what mood states are they're these states you get stuck in and they're stable so emotional states themselves are very unstable. They move around all the time. You flip flop from one to another the whole time. Mood states are like the kind of ruts in the road. And what we, what we aim for in a dog's life is obviously they have a happy life. They're running around doing all the stuff we want them to do. They're not having much trauma. But what we want them also to have is a positive mood state. And we call that positive mood state resilience. Mm. And we start teaching the dog to promote his or her own positive uh, mood state through their own behavior and their, their own actions. Um, I think some people call it emotional intelligence in dogs. It's this spin-off from human psychology, emotional intelligence, teaching a dog to be emotional intelligent, which you do through the puppy training and that sort of thing in giving them lots of experiences. This, this, is, this is what we do in socializing puppies. We give them resilience. And what that is actually, in actual fact, is mood state resilience. We give them this pillar where they get stuck in this rut of actually being in a good mood and being happy. And it yeah. takes them quite a few knocks to become that happy. But if you knock them enough times, then you're gonna get um, the situation where things become unstable and you can actually push them over into going into, into an unhappy place in terms of their mood state. And that's what we, what we call anxiety and that's what we call depression. Mm. Dogs get depressed. We know it. We can see them. They shut down. They don't want to interact anymore. Mm. We see anxious dogs all the time. Um, really, really, it's probably the most common behavior problem we see is dogs that are anxious. They, 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 they develop this generalized anxiety where it starts off just being frightened of fireworks or frightened of noises. And it extends to being the microwave. Somebody come into the door. They don't want to go out for walks anymore. They just want to get back home, start spending more and more time in their baskets. These dogs are both anxious and depressed. What that is, is a, a shift in mood state. That mood state has become really stable. And then yeah. that mood state starts directing <coughs> the emotional states that dog's capable of experiencing. And now, what, really, yeah. mm, sorry, Robert, go on. Now, what I was just going to, the other point I was going to make is, is one really important point here is if you are depressed, that doesn't mean you're depressed all the time. What it means is you have moments, even if you talk to people with, 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 with severe depression, they have times when they can come out of that and they feel, you know, moments of happiness and joy. And it's the same with dogs. What, what, what we'll see with depressed dogs, they have times when they, yes, they can come out of their baskets. If you as a behaviorist go knock on the door to see, the, to see this dog that's, that the owner's reported to be unhappy, doesn't want to, doesn't want to go for walks anymore. Um, when you knock on the door with your bag of treats, you're somebody new. The dog's gonna probably jump up and come and greet you and say hello and wagging the tail and all this kind of thing. So your assessment of that mood state, that emotional state is gonna be, well, that, that, that dog's actually quite happy. But as soon as you leave, 
that dog will then go back into that rut, which is his, his mood state. That's where he's living at the moment. Yep. So I think it's one of the things we need to be aware of as behaviorists, if you're working uh, professionally with dogs, that it's often really useful, not only to get good um, owner testimony, testimony, but also try and get uh, owner video as well over periods of time, and even get them to start filling out these charts, which is what we were doing with, with, with the EMRA system, actually plotting where dogs are mm -hmm. on the chart and this kind of stuff. Uh, and then you can extrapolate that into, into making a judgment on the mood state where this is. And I think once the, once the owners start to understand the dynamics between the two, and I imagine there are dog owners listening to this as well and who will watch this in the future, once you start understanding the dynamics of the two and how they interplay with each other, you begin to realize how important mood state is. What you're aiming for is, is to get your dog into that good mood state rut where they then stick. And then that's the resilience and to avoid the bad. And sometimes that's more difficult if you have a dog that has early life trauma. A lot of the rescues coming over from Romania and these other places are, are often traumatized dogs. Uh, dogs brought up on puppy farms, they're the ones that come in with, with, with problems with mood state where they, they're gonna drift towards going towards bad mood states, stable bad mood states rather than um, good mood states. What you can do with resilience on those is more questionable you'll be able to get them maybe to somewhere in between, but you're, they're never going to be 100% resilient dogs. So you can classify these dogs in terms of the kinds of mood states they're going to have um, over the coming years, rather than judging them purely by their emotional states. So that's how I see mood states playing in to the overall schema of things. They're incredibly useful because they represent the stability of being stuck in the wrong place or stuck in the right place. And actually, uh, it's kind of everything mm. when you think about it for that individual dog. And this is something we've got to be mindful of when we think we're helping dogs to do certain things because we're using reinforcement to get yes. them to do certain things, uh, which might not have value uh, or able to shift really that mood state because we can get them just to, and they can be engaging in an activity, but not of being course. truly present for it from an emotional point yes. of view. And I think we talk about trying to be available to the emotional truth of the dog. And I think mood state is that it is, that is the kind of essence of this. Really. It, it is. And I, I think it's one of these things where, where we, we fail sometimes as behaviorists and explaining the importance of the mood state and the resilience of it. And the fact that owners need to get used to the idea that their dogs are never going to be fully stable from the point of view. They're not necessarily, you know, they, they may never be like the next door neighbor's dog which is the solid old, you know, brick, brick built Labrador that nothing phases him and he's out there and he's socializing with all the other dogs and he's happy as Larry. Um, there are some dogs that are never gonna be like that. And that comes down to personality type, which, it, which is important. Mm -hmm. um, and it all also comes down to that dog's experiences through life, early life experiences and experiences thereafter. So it's good old, you know, nurture and nature, isn't it? Working together. So there are some dogs are different. And I think as behaviorists, we measure that in terms of the kinds of mood states they're gonna, they're gonna end up in. Um, I think mood state is one of these things that's got a, that, that's, it's a name that's banded around too frequently misused and is more associated with, with psychiatric illness. But I see it as something which is a measure of, of really more personality and experience. So mm. it's, it's just a word I use to measure you know, what that dog is as a as a phenotype as a as as a being as a, mm. as you know as a, as an emotional being and i think when we think about early development and especially this is just my own thought on it but um and i'm kind of having this play out with my own young dog molly who's mm. nine months now but she came 14 weeks so she wasn't a puppy puppy as such in that sense and she came as came to rescue so she'd had a bit of experience beforehand but part of this thing for me i seeing her general shift yes from a cautious pessimistic outlook to more of an optimistic one came not from doing lots of training with her but giving her those opportunities through that kind of experimental learning to kind of have those wins yes and to even and that includes dealing with stress mm. and finding those wins do you think there's a correlation there for when we when we start thinking about how we support young dogs especially in building that kind of mood state and that resilience yeah, I, I think it's one of these things where we do a lot of things by rote and we have all these tick boxes 
that we go through the dogmacy umbrellas and so much of this and so much of that that's that that's a good thing but i think i think what it does is leave out a lot of the dogs the necessity for dogs to actually explore things themselves i think one of the most important things in life is to be able to make mistakes and learn from them and i think sometimes the way we we channel dogs is that we don't give them that chance to actually make mistakes in a safe space and i yeah. think that's what you're talking about because that, that that's sense. where you learn that's that's where you build up this thing called resilience where we you know we, we tend to hide them away a little bit too much perhaps um early on um and channel and restrict what and who they come into contact with far too much um, so we're kind of dictating their early life stories, if you like. We're kind of writing it for them and laying it out before them. And I think there's a big emphasis, isn't there, on a, we tend to have a big bias and a big kind of promotion for caregivers of a very structured educational yes. approach, yes. which we don't have with humans, of course, no, because no. We, let, we allow that first four or five years to be very experimental in learning. Yeah. Well, uh, look, look at education in places like Finland. Hmm where it's all, it all revolves around play. Yeah, and of course, there's a lot of uh, good stuff being done around play. Mm -hmm. uh, as I learned, even with Molly, you know, when she was um, that first two or three months, we had playtime every day, which she initiated when she was ready and she picked what she wanted to do. Yes, and uh, we're I talking about playtime, Cortex playtime, not, not Pangsep Systems playtime. Uh, <laughs> yes, I don't say, know. say, say yes. <laughs> The answer I say, is yes. I say, I'll say yes then. Okay. Cool. Yeah, the answer is yes so. because because I one of the things I would argue is that um, prove to me that Panksepp's play system isn't that an output of what we call play that's coming from the cerebral cortex, i.e., the dog's thinking part of the brain, mm -hmm. rather than the instigator of play. We say, ah, oh, the dogs, the dogs in play, the dogs playing. I see Panksepp's play system as actually being an output of that, which is where some of the reward comes from. To say because there's a lot of component parts to play. Yeah, Lots yeah, there are. That, that, that's what I mean. It's not, yeah, it's not yeah. one thing. But I thought I'd throw that. Yeah. I'll throw yeah. that in there just to, just as a kind of spanner in the works mm. of what we were talking about in that first part about emotions. But sorry, I kind of interrupted. No, no, no. And uh, that's good. And I think um, uh, that's the thing that I noticed when Molly was doing that and engaging in play, and I was able to in to sect in that certain things that I wanted her to experience and to do. She was in a really open uh, kind of mind then to kind of take on things that were going on around her. Uh, and for me, I think we have to think about, I know we talk about this a lot, but getting behaviors that are that are created, because we can do that very easily mm -hmm. now, and uh, how to do stuff is very good. This thing about having internal value is very important, especially when you start thinking about those experiences over time, the drip, drip, drip that you were talking about, yeah. about what behavioral function uh, an animal or a human has that actually has value, that actually thinks this is gonna help me. Um, this is what poor therapy is like for humans. We've had a, a big rise in uh, some, not all, um, kind of uh, especially the life coach area yeah, I'm, not, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not down on all life coaches but no. some just become very good at telling people what they should do yes uh, and then somebody does it because it's sometimes that life coach has experienced that themselves and it kind of worked for them it doesn't mean it's going to work for someone else or there's going to be Definitely. value to them uh, and actually when you think about all the component parts of the stuff we discussed today and I can't believe the hour's gone Robert which is amazing uh this comes back to the individual and all the stuff that you've mentioned and all the other people that we're learning from all the time people like Sindor and Sarah and uh Sheila and lots of people the list is very long about actually being better at observing that dog in front of you yes uh over like say a period of time that chart you're talking about do you have a version of that that I could put into the file section in the in the group that people could see what that looks like visually Yes, yeah, absolutely. That'd be great. Yeah, yeah think... I'll, I'll send you some of my PowerPoint slides that show that with the animations in them. It's a running PowerPoint, show you the animations in them. Oh, that's very um, kind of you. This is, this is stuff I was doing with Dogs Trust between uh, and hearing dogs and lots of other people um, between about 2015 up to lockdown, actually. Yeah. So I, I, you know, I'll, I'll send you those uh, as, as a block so you can see how I see mood state fitting in with emotional state. And how you can plot these things out on the chart, and you That's can really run, amazing. you can you can run the animation, 
in the PowerPoint to see how it actually works. And so that, that'll give you an idea of what I was talking about. Because we have a lot of caregivers in the group, and I know just looking at some of the comments here, and a lot of the dogs who are, are caregivers who have gone down the train more, train more, train more route, sure. uh, but then have started to go down more of the listen more and observe more route mm. and trying to find that truth. And I think uh, it's giving people permission from a science, very good, strong science point of view to be more available to better observation. Mm. And, and then being able to communicate that to the caregiver. I think that's the key, like you say, yes. it's really getting people invested. Uh, Robert, we're, we're right at the end here. Um, uh, there's quite a few messages in the chat. So uh, if you get a chance uh, later, have a look at some of those, if you, if you want yeah. to. Those. But, yeah. Uh, so. I probably won't what, come back to those till later tonight or it'll be tomorrow morning. Yeah, and you can so I've got, so, yeah, I've got other things I need to do, and I don't know how long that's going to go on for. I've got another thing at eight. Yeah, only if, only if you can, obviously. Got, I mm, yeah, but, but I'll, I'll, I'll be in there as soon as I can, and of course, pick up. Mm, but I think maybe we should, if we can spend another five, ten minutes. Yeah. Um, and move on to, I, I'm going to pick up a point that you made where uh, you said that we've got all the stuff going on. We We kind of impose our thinking on what on what owners ought to be doing with their dogs. And for me, that comes down to being overconfident in what we think we know. And this is a thorny issue <clears throat> that, 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 that I only realized in 2017, when I was asked to go and give a lecture at Royal Society of Medicine in London on the placebo effect in, in animals, of all things, uh, which was an interesting one for me. Um, but what I took away from that is that I was actually quite shocked and surprised how much division there was between two science communities, the, the, the medics and the neurologists and the neuroscientists on the one hand, and the psychiatrists and the psychologists on the other. The two just did not meet. And the point of this seminar was to try and bring these two groups together and discuss a very complicated and important area of, of, of human medicine, which is functional symptoms in humans. I'm not going to tell you what that is because we haven't got time. People can look it up and find out what it is. Um, but it's one of these things, it's one of these areas of, of, of psychiatry, which sort of bridge the gap between medicine and psychiatry. Uh, as I say, I was absolutely shocked at how, at how much animosity there was between these two groups. And I took, away, I took that away with me and, and have been thinking about it really ever since. And as I said earlier on, I'm, I'm very pleased I didn't, I didn't go in or come into this, 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 this job um, as, as a kind of psychologist or get too sidetracked or funneled down any particular avenue, you know, jack of all trades me. Um, because at about uh, 2015, 2016, I was also uh, uh, required to take up teaching of learning theory with COPE. And I bought all the books and from the, the university library and read all through those. And it was, it was okay, but it didn't really make any sense to me. The idea that you divided up um, reinforcement learning, operant learning, and, uh, and uh, classical Pavlonian conditioning and all this kind of stuff. To me, it was all one and the same. And to your average dog, it's all one and the same. And it's something I've been thinking about a lot recently. And I've come to the conclusion that the, the, the problem with what we're dealing with here is we're dealing with two sciences. We're dealing with, with what I call a hard science, which basically is physics. Physics is a hard science, and all other sciences are based on physics. Physics is the science that comes up with predictive models, predictive theories of how the world works. So Newton's law of gravity, for example, 1969, Newton's laws of gravity flew men to the moon and brought them back again. The, the, the technology they used to get those rockets up to the moon, the computers were terrible. The technology was crap, really old, old stuff, you know, almost lead taps and this kind of stuff. And yet they managed to use Newton's, you know, theories of gravity, uh, gravity to send those people up into the moon, up to the moon, land that thing on the moon, slingshot it, slingshot it around the moon using moon's gravity and bring it all the way back to earth, just from a, a predictive theory that's come from physics. Quantum mechanics has done the same thing. Quantum mechanics tells us how, how mobile phones work, how satellites work. Without quantum mechanics, we'd have none of that. It's all predictive theory. What we have in messy biology, psychology, what we do in behavior is messy, it's warm, wet, it's messy, it's, 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 it's not organized well. We do not have predictive theories. We have 
explanatory theories. The greatest explanatory theory there is, is um, Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection. Now, if I took a dog today and I tried to predict how that dog's going to breed and what that dog's outcome is going to be over the next you know, generations, generations and generations from now, I'd have no idea. And the reason for that is because natural selection is an explanatory theory. All it can do is tell me or explain why something's happened when it's already happened. So all, all you can do with, 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 with explanatory theories is look back in history, but with predictive theories like physics, you can look forwards, you can make predictions. Really, really important difference. And I think what, what, what we've done and what psychologists have done with something like learning theory is they think it's a predictive theory, but it's not, it's an explanatory theory. They think it's predictive because they think if you use Pavlovian conditioning, you ring a bell, dog salivates. Dog hears the doorbell, dog runs to the door. We can train a dog to press a lever, operant conditioning. The dog presses the lever, gets a reward. People think that's predictive, but it's not. It's predictive some of the time, but how many times does it fail? Mm. You and I as behaviorists see it fail all the time. That means it's not predictive, and yeah. yet we think it is. And I think as, as behaviorists, we are dealing with a science which is, it's not that good at, at making predictions about what's going to happen. Mm. Look at what's happened with what we understand about the brain. 1950s was, was, was a time where serendipitously, scientists really believed they cracked the, 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 the mystery of what mental, what, what depression was. They came up with this monoamine theory of depression. Yeah, we know what it is, it's all about serotonin. We have all these drugs that we can, we can produce, huge piles of cash going into pharmaceuticals, making these things, uh, antidepressants and that kind of thing. Here we are now in the 2020s. I can tell you that in 2010, the pharmaceutical industry, Big Pharma, abandoned all research in psychiatric disease, not spending any more money on it. There are no more drugs being developed for mental health since 2010. For the last 10 years, not, nothing more has been developed because the drug companies know that we know nothing about how the brain works. We've had massive projects, tons and tons of money being poured into projects like the Big Brain Project. 2019 was the big year of the brain. Piles and piles of, of government money, um, corporate money, industry money, research all getting together with all these scanners trying to do this work, people like Feldman Barrett doing her, her work with her scanning on people. We've generated vast amounts of data with all the computers we've got now, huge amounts of it, and yet we still don't know what consciousness is. We have no idea. We still don't know what, what depression is. We've got some sort of inkling, but we've got no idea how to treat it. No idea at all. Learning theory is the same. It's this thing, it's this black box where we think we, we can see predictive outcomes coming out as behavior, but actually we've got no idea what's going on in that black box. No, no. And I think, well, <clears throat> and, and I think my, my, my kind of mission, if you like, is, is one of healing and reconciliation. And I think we need, to, we need to be a bit humble in our industry. Stop arguing, stop taking positions about, you know, raw feeding is better than using commercial feeding complete feeding. No, it's not complete feeding is better. We do the same with learning theory. Balanced training is better. Force-free training is better. What are we doing with this dog? How is this learning? How is, this, how, is, how is learning theory working in this particular dog? What are we doing with this training? The fact is, we're actually quite unsure because we've no idea how the brain works. We've no idea what's going on inside this black box, inside all those 10 you know, 10 billion, 17 billion neurons and trillions, trillions of connections. I think we need to be a bit more humble in trying to work with each other on both sides and being less argumentative about who's right and who's wrong. Because our theories yeah. are explanatory, they're not predictive. What an explosive way to end, Robert. I think that's uh, just looking at some of the messages on the in there as well. I think you've also really, really framed well a way of looking at this and I think for me we, we have for a long time been talking about dogs yes. and I think what this is about is who are the dogs yes in fact all that matters is the dog 
Yes. Uh, and all the things, all those, all the richness, because you talked about that with that, with the, mm. the thing, and all the richness that brings to all the richness that dog brings to the table regarding their lived experience. Yes, of course. And, and, and that, so we do need multiple voices. This is obviously one of the, the reasons I've set up the dog center care group. And, and the, because there are so many voices, this is not something that one person can just try and try and box in and brand and, and sell. It's, it, we need multiple disciplines, multiple voices. And what I love about this kind of landscape, Rob, actually, is the input we're getting on an anecdotal level from the caregiver. Mm. now has a voice in this yes because in fact probably the, the most important voice actually in yeah. some ways because uh and that's why this is actually quite an avant-garde kind of movement really i think it is mm. and i think i think we need to get away from this relationship of me 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 me, me the kind of therapist you the client you the customer at the end it actually has to be a conversation between the two because it's not yeah. like other disciplines the fact is there's so much we don't know and there's so much that the owners know because they live with that dog. Yeah. They know far more about the personality of that dog and the emotional lives of that dog than we ever will as the behaviorist going in. So we really have to, we have to spend more time listening to what they have to say. And this is something that's become really important in veterinary medicine and that, that I've promoted a lot um, in that vets really need to, often as, as vets, we, we were often in a hurry with short consultations and we didn't necessarily have time to just let the owners speak and let them tell their story about the dogs. And owners often come in feeling embarrassed to, 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 to talk to vets and talk about what they think is wrong with the dog. They expect, you know, they want the vet to tell them because they see the vet as the expert. It really needs to be much more of a two-way conversation. And I've always tried to promote to vets when I, when, I, when I speak to vet groups, they've really got to just shut their mouths and let the owners speak. Let the owners tell the story. The, 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 the most common story they hear from an owner is, I'm worried, I, I just feel there's something not quite right about my dog. What the vet should do at that point is shut up and let the owner speak. Let the owner tell the story. And we need to be the same as behaviorists. What we shouldn't be doing is, is, is simply taking the dog out and doing some tests on the dog and seeing how the dog behaves around us. We need to listen to what the owner has to say because yeah. they will know that dog far better than we do. And that's so important. And it's something I, I do on my uh, unpacking the emotional workshops is really put emphasis on this connecting through the emotional experience because we all have one. Uh, and um, uh, that's been amazing. Robert, that's, what a great way to finish. Um, we could probably do several more hours actually, but I really appreciate your time today. The response has been amazing in the group. And um, uh, where can people find out more about you or follow the work that you do, Robert? Um, I guess petcpd.com but probably just keep looking in your place. Brilliant. I'll I'm, not, I'm not somebody who does a lot of media, you know, social media stuff and self-promotion and that kind of stuff. I, I well, beaver away in the background. I'll, um, I'll make sure we share a link to petcpd.com. Yeah, I do. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I know you and I have discussed about uh, thinking about a new project for within dog center care. And that's something Indeed, we'll, we'll yes, have a little yes. chat about that. And then we can yes. announce it. It's, it's quite exciting for the group who are really interested in thinking about uh, taking certain aspects and, and looking at things and unpacking things together in a safe space. I think it's going to be really, especially for those who are interested in all the things we're talking about. So watch out for that, folks. Uh, Rob and I will have a chat about that and, and look at that. Just to let everybody know, we've got the wonderful Dr. Holly uh, Tet here next Saturday, actually, four o'clock. Uh, we'll be focusing in on, on uh, Holly's work with trauma. Uh, and uh, well, thank you, Robert. Thank you so much. Really no, my, my, my great pleasure. I hope uh, and thank you everybody useful. in the group and sorry about some of the spamming again please have a great weekend and uh, look forward to seeing you soon take okay, care good. bye 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 bye